government problem has been solved with government band-aid, which has been solved by government band-aid. So if you pull off government band-aid, you have three more broken band-aids underneath it that sometimes make things worse. The EPA was not meant to go out and, and harass Oregonians and, and murder or Oregonians. What you're inferring is, you know what? If we legalize heroin tomorrow, everybody's going to use heroin. How many people here would use heroin if it was legal? I bet nobody would put their hand, oh yeah, I need the government to take care of me. I don't want to use heroin, so I need these laws. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Logan for Liberty podcast. How are you all doing? I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I am coming at you from the Pacific Northwest, where the sun shines so bright only to rain just a few hours later. I was rethinking my globalism video, discussion video, off the cuff that I uploaded yesterday and... There was a point that I was making at the beginning that didn't quite pan itself out in a way that I wanted it to towards the 20 minute mark when my discussion or video ended. And I was thinking about it, I was going through my thoughts, I was in a retrospective type of situation, I was thinking about the point I wanted to actually make about globalism. Basically the prompt or the topic or the angle I was going at from the video yesterday was that globalism is a meaningless or essentially useless word in the same way that racist, sexist, homophobic bigot is. And that it really doesn't mean anything among its users. It's just one of those things that they throw at you. And, and I explained <clears throat> why well, I thought I explained where globalism globalism comes from, what they mean by it. Essentially, they think that any economic division of labor among countries is globalism. So if I own a business and I decide to expand my company and move some of my company to another country, they would get all protectionist. And these are people that claim to hate socialism and communism, but uh, they tend to be very socialistic and communistic in this way. But essentially they would say, I'm killing American jobs by outsourcing jobs to other countries. And listen, there is a concern about that in the temporary short-sighted view of it and looking at a particular industry. Yeah, there is definitely something to worry about. But that is a problem that eventually solves itself and through human action, we can solve it. So I want to revise my original point and say that globalism isn't a meaningless or useless word when used correctly, when used consistently, and when used by people who actually know what they believe. I now want to say, also, that globalism is an, instinct is an instinctual knee-jerk repudiation. I think instinctual and knee-jerk are kind of... Uh, tautologies or it's being redundant I'm basically saying the same thing because it's what a knee-jerk reaction is but not all instincts are based on emotions so I think it's fine it's an instinctual knee-jerk repudiation and it has its pillars in devout ideological inflexibility meaning these people they have an ideology and that's what they see and they will use anything to support what they are saying they have no consistency to their beliefs whatsoever. Their, their ideology is straight nationalism. In, in this Logan for Liberty podcast, I want to talk about maybe the pros of globalism, the cons of globalism, the pros of nationalism, and the cons of nationalism. Those are things that I want to talk about because I think we can have a really productive conversation about it. You see, when I think when I when I heard the word globalism and the way I understood it was always selling out your national sovereignty politically in the sense of p 
pol politics and governance. I always pictured, like, if the UN was to write laws, the United Nation were to write laws that would affect the United States, to me, that was a sense of globalism. Or anything like that. But to a lot of these people that throw around the word globalist, a lot of them are national socialists. And globalism is a much more broad... They have a much more broad definition of globalism than I do. As I said earlier, they they really... They mix in economics and politics into one little thing. They have that sort of left-wing streak in their ideology... Where, if a job's outsourcing, they want the government to get involved and keep those jobs and punish those businesses for trying to leave to increase production. They're, they're honestly national socialists. They claimed to hate communists. I mean, a lot of them are pretty open about being Nazis or national socialists. Or protectionists, because, you know, we, we need this to save the American worker. America first. And I like the... The idea of American first. But as with anything, there's pros and cons. Everything is not black and white. And with that being said, not everything has a gray area. There are some things that are wrong. Some things that are right. And it's a black and white situation. But this has a little more nuance, which is why I'm talking about it. So a lot of these people would... Oh, I hate communism. I hate Marxists. I hate the left. And a lot of them were socialists, but they didn't even know it. And you talk to some of these people, and they they're they're talking about how, cat or um socialism and communism, is the evil of the world that needs to be stopped. Joseph Stalin was a terrible person, and we're glad that the socialist movement in America somewhat died. And Bernie Sanders is a nut job. And then you talk to them, and then they start talking about how we need tariffs to protect American jobs. Or how we should punish companies for trying to leave the U.S. And I'm, I'm trying to find the disconnect between these people who claim to be capitalists. But then start advocating for these quasi-socialist policies that are meant to protect the worker. And this is national socialism, by the way. I'm not talking about the... The way I define capital or uh, communism, the way I see it, it's a redistributive... Workers own the means of production type of ideology, but it has a state, like it has a centralized state that controls it. And the way I see socialism is it's the same sort of redistribution of wealth, workers own the means of production type thing, but it's not implemented by a centralized force. Co or socialism is administrated a little more in a, in a decentralized manner. There's really not that many differences. Although there are different types of left-wing redistributionist ideologies. Anarcho-communism, anarcho-syndicalism, syndicism? I think it's syndicism. Syn cynical, no, definitely, I think it's syndicism, whatever. Um, libertarian socialism, libertarian communism... Uh, Marxist libertarians, it, national socialists, and in my opinion, a national socialist is basically just a communist with nationalist tendencies. So, without further ado, I think I've already beat that horse enough. I've already explained how these supposed right-wing conservatives or, you know, anti-communist and anti-socialists are really old school democratic socialists. So let's talk about nationalism. Here, here's the stuff about nationalism that that's good in my opinion. This is why I like. This is these are the aspect aspects of nationalism that I like. Let let's say that you think that a government is necessary. Let's say that you're not. An anarcho-capitalist, which is the which is libertarianism applied consistently. That's what I see as a an anarcho-capitalist is libertarianism applied extremely consistently. You take a fine comb, 
and then you just you go through, and that's how you get anarcho-capitalism. And anarcho-capitalism, it's not, you know, they don't think that we shouldn't have any rules, but they think that the state is an unnecessary force. That state is coercion. Sorry, my allergies are kicking in. Change of su Sudden change of weather, especially here in the Pacific Northwest. It is, it is crazy. And when you think about it, there's no reason to be agonized over the thought of some sort of globalism. I just wanted to throw that in there before I got before I get started. But nationalism recently it's been treated like a scurrilous type of thing. Like it's like it's this huge uh violent, dangerous, scary, evil thing. And it's really not. It's embroidered with good ideas and it has it's embroidered with some bad ideas. Things that are good about nationalism, as I was talking about, and let's be clear, any form of government you have has the ability to be recipped by any sort of clandestine uh, or uh, every government, whether it is a nationalist government, a globalist government, or everything in between, can be despotic. That's just a fact. It, the pow Any power that is available can be usurped. At any point in time. So let's be clear about that. So the pros of nationalism though. I tend to think. If if you are to agree that a government is a necessary thing to protect the rights of the individual. Or that people have a right to consent to their own government. A government. Governments are better. Sorry I am struggling right now. Governments are better instituted over smaller geographical locations. The less physical area that a government controls, the better. And not only that, as we all know, because we see cities like New York, Los Angeles, where you're able to fit a massive amount of people in a small population or in a small geographical location, you already know where I'm going with this, governments are also better instituted among smaller population pockets. The less people that a government controls, the better. And if you believe in some form of democratic processes, not pure democracy, but if you believe any sort of democracy, you want your vote to count as much as possible. Although, this is a conversation for another video, but nobody really likes democracy. Everybody likes democracy when it suits their agenda. So let me just make this point real quick. Democrats... Well, not Democrats. If we had put gay marriage up to vote in 2012 on a national scale, and at that time, most people disagreed with it. Even blue states like Oregon, the state where I live in, which is considered California light, even Oregon voted to keep gay marriage outlawed, and Republicans are outnumbered here two to one. So let's make that very clear. With that being said... Oregon voted to knock down gay marriage. The Supreme Court had to step in. So let's say we had a national vote about gay marriage and it was voted down 59 to 41. You think Democrats would be like, oh, well, you know, we held it up to the democratic process. That's democracy. Gay marriage is illegal. And it should stay that way because the people spoke. No, none of them would say that. That is insane. At least most honest conservatives are... Most. Uh, not all, because not all conservatives are the same. But at least there's a part of the conservative movement that's like, Yeah, we don't like democracy. Democracy's bad. My rights aren't up for debate. Without further, without further ado, let's continue. I digress, ladies and gentlemen. Governments are better instituted over a smaller geographical area. So the, the, the smaller amount of land that a government controls, the better. That way you can leave. And if you believe in some sort of democratic process, whether it's voting on key issues or voting for representatives to change administrations, to have a peaceful way of uh, changing 
from one group of people from one power structure to another, then you'll probably support some sort of democratic element, like a democratic republic, like the United States Constitution was supposed to be. Um, then you will, ex then you will probably favor a population, or you you probably want your vote to count a lot more than it does. And the way you do that is by having governments control a smaller population of people. So this is why I prefer nationalism in this sense over globalism. Because I wouldn't want a worldwide government of any sort or a giant convoluted government. Because the more people who vote, the less my vote counts. We can get into the discussion about whether or not voting is necessary, whether a vote is violence. I tend to be sympathetic towards them, and that's a conversation we can have. So, for example, the United States Constitution, the presidential election, is not decided by a popular vote. Which is a good thing, it's decided by the Electoral College, which sort of, because what the United States is, for people who don't understand and for people who hate the Electoral College, the United States isn't just one blob of government. It, it's supposed to be just a, an administrative institution that kind of oversees and keeps the peace and helps to unionize 50 different sub-sovereign states that have their own sovereignty where most of our issues come around election cycle should be handled. Which is why we have the Electoral College. Because l let's look at the different elected representatives in the federal government. So, we have 100 senators, two for each state. Senators are decided by a statewide vote. Much like the governors of each state are decided by a statewide vote. Our uh, congressmen in the House of Representatives, they are... They are given geographical locations within each state. A lot of them are gerrymandered districts. We can talk about that, and that's understandable that you would oppose that. But for the most part, they are decided, they are divided up. They're the closest thing we have to actually representing the people, as far as elected representatives go, in the federal government. That's sort of a democratic process, and those are smaller populations deciding the elected representatives, which is why technically, according to the Constitution, Congress really has more power than the executive branch, the presidential. Well, no, they're, they're all co-equal branches of government. Let's make that clear. But there's a reason why Congress has control over the ability to declare war, and that has nothing to do with the economy. That, that's why the, their powers are like that. And that's why the executive branch doesn't have those major powers, but the executive branch has its own powers that are equal, but, you know... And that's the reason why the president, one single person, probably, even though the executive branch isn't the most powerful branch, it's an equal branch, the, pr the president, as a single person, is the most powerful person in the United States. Without, or j just putting that aside, there's, there's a reason right there. But nationalism as a whole in the United States, we have a sort of... We have our own version of nationalism. We have American nationalism, or yeah, America first. And then at some level, a lot of us were like, yeah, dude, Oregon's awesome. Washington's awesome. Texas, Texas pride. Texas is nationalist in the sense that they are proud of America, and then Texans are proud of Texas. So that's why nationalism is favorable, because you have smaller pockets. The government is easier to control to represent your beliefs. You have a bigger impact on local and state elections than you do on federal elections. Which, again, let me just make this clear, is why the president isn't elected by the popular vote. Because that one man has too much power to have such a control over the population to have it decided just by a democratic vote. Every other government elected official, and I say elected official, that's elected, that has any sort of um, election doing... I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to word this because my brain's farting on me. Any elected official where the people have a say in it, so this isn't including the Supreme Court... <clears throat> is decided up by a popular vote except for the president of the United States for good reason. So 
th th that's why nationalism is good. Here's why nationalism is bad. Here are the cons of nationalism. We've seen the cons of nationalism. We've seen Adolf Hitler. We've seen people, we've seen white nationalism. That's definitely not good. And I would argue that black nationalism isn't good either. Although, uh, believe it or not, black nationalists and white nationalists get along better than you actually think. Nonetheless, let's talk about... Yeah, that that's why nationalism is not good. Because just like any form of government, no matter how big the population is, no matter how big the geographical area is, the population is able to vote in policies that are still authoritarian. Authoritarianism is always prevalent, whether or not... You have a big area controlled by the government, whether you have decentralized governments. Any government has the ability to be usurped by authoritarians. So, that's something usurped. I should say usurped. I keep saying usurped. Usurped. By authoritarians, every government has any concentration of power it can be usurped. By any authoritarian who wants to use the government for their own theocratic means, for their authoritarian beliefs, or because, well, they want power in general. You know, for their their self-interest, only their self-interest, without any form of altruism. Being self-interested isn't bad. Being selfish isn't bad, necessarily. But when we're talking about politics, when we're talking about usurping giant concentrations of political power where you have the force of government on your side yeah that gets a little a little scary so let's talk about globalism what's the pro of globalism well as a capitalist i think the division of labor is a fantastic thing that allows different industries to concentrate on producing one product as proficiently as possible therefore making the process cheaper for example let, let's just say, all right, there's no factories, okay, but let's look at division of labor and and, 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 a la and that logical. There's certain words when you put them together that just, there's a certain words that you say, depending on the next word, you won't be able to pronounce the next word. I was going to say an, an illogical, like an analogy, but it just made me stutter because it didn't sound like it was coming out right. Nonetheless, let's look at it in analogical way let's make an analogy of division of labor let's say for example that you uh have a dairy farm you personally have a dairy farm okay you as an individual you the listener has a dairy farm your neighbor has a beef farm so you both have farms yours is concentrated on dairy the other is concentrated on meat on beef your other neighbor makes shoes. Your other neighbor makes pants. Your other neighbor makes shirts. Right? You as a dairy farmer, you're not going to have the time to try to make your own shoes. You're not going to... I mean, if you're a dairy farmer, you can slaughter the cow for meat. But you're not concentrated on meat. You're concentrated on milk. So, you're making milk. You don't have enough time to make your own pants, to make your own shirts, to make your own shoes. You don't have enough time to process your own meat you're making milk the person who owns the beef farm doesn't have enough time to you know say say he's not a dairy farm so he doesn't have the time to make his own milk he doesn't have the time to make his own shoes he doesn't have the time to make his own shirt he doesn't have the time to make his own pants you get it you move on down the line the person who's a tailor for pants doesn't make his own shoes but he he, he can make his own shirts but him and the other because him there's two tailors in town there's the guy that makes a shirt the guy that makes the pants they decided hey i'll make the pants because i'll be able to produce a higher quantity of pants if that's all i make and then the other guy's like yeah all right sounds good i'm a tailor i'll make shirts and i'll make a higher quantity of shirts because if you're making pants i make shirts we can produce more shirts and pants than we could have if i was the only tailor and i was making shoes or uh, uh shirts and pants at the same time and the guy who's making shoes, even though, you know, he's good with fabrics, obviously, he doesn't have to make pants, shirts, jackets, socks, underwear. He can just make shoes. And here's the beauty of division of labor, because we have one guy concentrated on milk, we have one guy concentrated on beef, one guy concentrated on, you know, those individual aspects that I said. 
And actually, let's throw in another thing into this analogy, another career. We have a doctor. Imagine if the doctor had to spend all his time trying to eat, trying to produce food and milk, nutrition. And let's say he tried also having to make his own clothes. He wouldn't have a lot of time to be a doctor. So this is where division of labor becomes extremely beneficial. Because the doctor is able to treat other people... Or is able to buy other clothes, buy shoes from the shoemaker, pants from a tailor, sh shirts from a tailor, buy beef from a farmer, and buy milk from a farmer. He is able to concentrate most of his time on being a doctor. The shoemaker, because he's not having to make his own clothes or grow his own food, has enough time to make shoes. Therefore, shoes aren't 150 bucks. I mean, they can be if you're buying designer shoes. But for the most part, you're looking, if it's on sale, 25 bucks to 60 bucks depending on the brand, whether or not it's on sale, so on and so forth. You can buy a cheap t-shirt for like 15 bucks. You can buy a pair of pants for like 25 bucks. At least where I'm at, with my size. So, imagine imagine that everything is produced cheaply, more proficiently. That is division of labor. However, most people recognize this though. Most people recognize that they do their job and they get compensated for that and then they can spend their money for doing this particular job in this scheme of division of labor in the system of division of labor and then go buy something that has been produced and created by something else and when that person who produced this particular product gets money they can go buy or yeah they can go buy or uh, have you know uh, purchase a service produced by somebody else that is the division of labor. Most people understand this. But when we start talking about it on a global scale, this is where economic globalism gets into it, people tend to freak out. And this is when you get the Alex Jones globalist types of people. Remember when Alex Jones used to be somewhat consistent? That is neither here or now. So just, just take that for example. So what if we want to buy cheaper steel from China? Understand that... Let's say that you really want factory jobs to stay in America, right? The factory jobs are important. Okay, well, what's one of the biggest costs of factories? I, I, I've worked in a factory. As a matter of fact, I still work in a factory. And I could tell you what one of the biggest costs we have is. Steel and other metal. Steel. Iron. Processed iron. Okay. And because all our machines, they are steel... We weld, we cut a lot, we recycle, and one of the biggest costs we have is steel. Now, the company that I work for wouldn't be able to employ a lot of us if they had to buy expensive steel. But because they were, at, well, who knows under Donald Trump now, <laughs> they used to be able to buy steel extremely cheaply from China or other countries. And because they were able to buy steel cheaply from these other countries, they had the excess money to hire more people. But that's something that is overlooked because, especially in the Rust Belt, the steel manufacturers, they might lose their jobs if they're competing with China. But as a result of those protectionist policies that protect the Rust Belt steel manufacturers... Factories that don't produce steel but rely on steel might have to cut down on some workers because they can't produce or they can't bring in the metal or machinery made by steel at a cheap enough price. Therefore, you have to lay a couple people off. You can, you easily spend a million bucks trying to bring in a new machine. Most people don't make a million bucks working in these factories a year. They're between 35 to maybe a hundred thousand dollars a year depending on the factory and depending on the position you just you just made it that much more expensive to hire these people because they can't bring in steel cheaply and when when we look at these protectionist policies that these ultra national socialist protectionists want to implement they're always looking at one particular industry rather than the expansive, they're always looking at it from a top-down perspective. Look at the bottom, these workers right here. But they're completely disregarding all the other industries that benefit from cheap steel. For example, the factory I work in. We need steel 
for our machines, but we can't buy it cheaply, and we're really careful when we weld or cut now. And as a result, our production can easily go down. And when we have any giant project to increase production to add more machineries in, well, guess what? Uh, we can't really afford it as much as we were able to. And let's not look at it from my industry. Let's look at it from the consumer. I like drinking soda. Soda is delicious. I love Coca-Cola. It's fantastic. A tar off on aluminum, steel. Yeah, that'll increase that price as a consumer. And then people working in Coca-Cola factories everywhere. Or people working uh, in America in an administrative sense. Well, you know, they lose some money because, you know, it, it, go, it goes on. Because they, ha they, they have to import tariffed metals that we pay a tariff on. Our prices go up as consumers. What if you like getting canned vegetables and canned fruit and canned chili, you know, pre-made canned stuff because it saves you time, you, ha you get nutrition, and it's cheap? Well, you're going to have to pay a little extra on that. What if you buy an automobile? Oh, you're going to have to pay a few thousand bucks extra on that. So not only does it hurt other industries that rely on these products that there's a tariff on, it also hurts the consumer. Only because we were concentrating on this one specific special interest group. And definitely we need to concentrate on them in the short term. We need to, whenever we increase production or outsource jobs, we need to recognize that, yeah, these people will probably lose their jobs. But we also need to understand that it's only a temporary thing. And through human action, they'll be able to find jobs. I kind of went on to tariffs and human action and markets a little more than I wanted to, but that is the one aspect of globalism that people don't like. But division of labor is one reason why I like globalism, because if we recognize division of labor on a local, on a statewide, and a national level, then why can't we recognize it on a global level? The con of globalism, which as we all know, is when a nation, a, a nation state starts selling out or starts uh, conceding its governance, its power to govern over the people that kind of consented over it to a international body. That's when globalism is bad, which is something I covered uh, when I was talking about why I think nationalism is preferable to globalism. Both nationalism and globalism have their benefits. Neither one are perfect. You kind of have to take, you know, the, the... So there's not always a middle ground on things. I hate centrists a lot because there's this weird thing among centrists where they think, Oh, I'm a centrist. I'm a moderate. We are so smart because we take... We, we look at both perspectives, and then we draw from the best. No, none of that bullshit. Just, everything's not black and white. We get it. But not everything has a gray area. We're not going to debate murder. We're not going to debate rape. Rape is bad. Murder is bad. There's no middle ground between, oh, you see, this person raped this girl because, you know, he really needed to get laid, and he just sucked at getting laid, so I understand his perspective. Like, all right, all right you can understand the motive, but there's no middle ground on that. So this is why I dislike centrists. And I know I used an extreme analogy to make my point. But not all centrist positions are right. Not everything is on the fence. Some things are right. Some things are wrong. And sometimes two sides of an issue are wrong. Sometimes two sides of an issue are right. And sometimes one side is right. Sometimes one side is wrong. Therefore, the middle ground is the preferable option that actually makes sense. That is when centrism is acceptable. But there's nothing virtuous about being a centrist at all. Nothing virtuous. That was sort of a little rant, but that's how I feel about, oh, I am an I am a centrist because I am reasonable. Ah, just knock it off. So I just want to close on this. A nation isolated from the rest of the world in an economic sense is is not by default. Safer or more prosperous. A rejection of imports shouldn't be confused for security. So that's my message to the quasi-nationalist. My message to globalists are 
you should be careful when you're advocating for international bodies that take away the sovereignty of one nation to give it away to another. We should have massive apprehensions about an assertion of power when it's on a national level, as well as, if not more, on a global level where your say-so, where your advocation, where your petition, where your grievances are never met because it's too bureaucratic and too large. So that's what I want to leave this on. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. This is the Logan for Liberty podcast. I will try to do more Logan for Liberty podcasts. And the reason why I'm going to do these podcasts is because it allows me to upload content and allows me to talk off the cuff about things that I'm passionate about and talk about some some headlining news. Today I didn't want to talk about news. Today I wanted to make a podcast about a video that I uploaded yesterday. So keep be on the lookout for more Logan for Liberty podcasts. Um, there's going to be at least one every week. And this will give me time to really concentrate on my more edited videos that I really want to make about topics that I really care about so I can make some higher quality. So not only are you going to get more quantity, you're also going to get some stuff with a higher quality. I'm trying to find the perfect balance while keeping a regular upload schedule and talking about the important issues that I feel are extremely important to talk about. So I talked about globalism on my last me rethinking my positions for my last video. And I talked a little bit about economics, a little nationalist economics, international economics. I talked about tariffs. And I had fun doing it. This is stuff I care about. It's easy for me to talk about it. I use less word whiskers. It's something I care about, something I study, and... And I hope to spread the love of economics and liberty to the rest of you. And I hope you all enjoyed it. So this is the end of the podcast. Please visit the description box and check out the links below to my Facebook and my Twitter. Help me grow my audience there as well as here. So don't forget to subscribe or hit the notification bell. Thank you guys for listening to the Logan for Liberty podcast. I hope you all have a fantastic day and stay free.